Hello, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Jack Orlick from the OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. Welcome to our webinar, Orchestrating Innovation Ecosystems, which is supported by the European H2020 programme. What we were just listening to there is a recording from the BBC archives of the Baka people of Central Africa. It's an extraordinary example of humans participating in what Bernie Krause has termed biophony, a concept that I think provides a unique starting point to think a little differently about innovation ecosystems. Krause has made extensive recordings of the natural world over decades, listening to the rich and complex sounds of environments from the Amazon basin to the mountain forests of California. And this experience led him to a realization what might initially seem to be a cacophony of animal voices in these habitats was in fact a highly orchestrated acoustic arrangement in which each creature had a niche and each individual animal responded to those around them in order to be heard. This is biophony. If you think about it, the crickets chirp at a high pitch. The elephants make these low bassy sounds and there's also a unique type of tree fog where the alpha sets an initial pace and the other frogs will sing in three, four time so that no frog ever croaks over another, no matter how fast the tempo gets. And this is important. Many of these sounds are intended to attract the mate. Others mark territory and keep threats at bay. They're essential to the survival of the animals. So this simultaneous rich interweaving of sound allows animals to cooperate and respond to threats. In his work, Krauss has found that biophony provides an often stark indicator of the health of an ecosystem. In 1988, he set up his recording equipment in Lincoln Meadows in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California, a forest management area where a logging company was about to perform selective loggings. There, he recorded a rich example of biophony. But returning a year later after the logging occurred to make a recording in the same conditions, the difference in sound astounded him. While the habitat looked broadly similar, the sound was entirely changed. Gone, he writes, was the thriving density and diversity of birds. Gone too was the overall richness that had been present the year before. Now, you might be wondering now whether you've come to the right webinar. What do the sounds of crickets, elephants, and tree frogs have to do with innovation? Well, as Opti has been working to test and develop approaches for the creation of anticipatory innovation ecosystems with colleagues at the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, we've become somewhat entranced by the ecosystem aspect of the term. Too often, innovation has been understood as a linear process, one that relies on one-way technology transfer or which can be plotted out through a clear intervention logic. What's increasingly been recognized is that innovation is facilitated through the interweaving of relationships between a diverse set of actors with diverse interests and a wide range of capabilities. Sometimes, like in Lincoln Meadows after the logging, it might appear as though everything is in place for innovation to occur, and yet nothing happens. In other situations, a cacophony of uncoordinated voices must be orchestrated in order to foster harmony and creativity. Governments and agencies need to be able to listen and hear what's missing to work out how to fill the gaps between ideas and new products or services. Through the development of innovation ecosystems, we aim to help varied stakeholders to hear each other and the world around them in order to better identify threats and opportunities. By supporting them to recognize their complementarities, we want them to draw on each other's capabilities, adjust and readjust their own activities and develop the kind of coordinated, creative relationships so well demonstrated by the recording of the backer I played earlier, in which something new is always being created in response to the environment around it. Within OPSI, we also aim to use novel approaches for futures thinking to support the development of innovation ecosystems to not only consider threats and opportunities in the present, but also become more future oriented in their goals and activities. My colleague Rodrigo will be showing a link to this work in the chat. This orchestration and future orientation is no easy task. And that's why we're delighted to welcome three leading thinkers and practitioners of innovation ecosystems to speak today. Dr. Lauma Moish Nish is Director of Technology Department of LIA, the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, which is working on an ambitious project to foster anticipatory innovation ecosystems. 
She has extensive expertise in technology transfer, the commercialization of science and intellectual property management, and additionally teaches at the BA School of Business and Finance in Riga. Charlie Ledbetter is a leading authority in innovation and creativity. He has, he has advised companies, cities and governments around the world on innovation strategy. And working with Jenny Winnell, he's recently turned his attention to systems innovation for the Rockwell Foundation, where he's been interested in the role of purpose, power, relationships and resources in unlocking system change. And last but not least, Kari Halevi leads the circular economy area at Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund. There, he's focusing on facilitating the development and scaling up the best circular solutions from Finland and around the world in order to support the transition to a fair and competitive economy that tackles the root causes of biodiversity loss, climate change, and overconsumption of resources. And we're also looking forward to welcoming you all tomorrow to a peer exchange session to share your own experiences. And you'll find a link to that uh, in the chat. Now, today's webinar will follow a fairly standard agenda of initial presentations from the speakers, followed by discussion. But before we start, uh, my colleague Chiara Bleckenbegner will launch a quick poll, and my other colleague, Mihai, will share some of our research. Um, Chiara, could you introduce the poll quickly, and then we'll hand over to Mihai. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. To get us warmed up, we invite you to respond to the poll that should pop up on your Zoom screen now. The question is, in your experience, what is the most important criterion for a successful cooperation between stakeholders in an ecosystem? And of course, we know that probably there's more than one that is important, but here we want to get a sense of the single most important criterion. And we'll have our panelists react to impressions from you, the participants, later on. So I'll give you all about 20 more seconds to make your replies. You can see lots of engagement already. And the thing that seems to come out on top is a close race between trust between stakeholders and a clear shared purpose. So I'm sure that will come up in the discussion later. Excellent. I think we have almost everyone answered. Thank you very much for that. And I'll hand over, close the poll now. And hand over to Mihai. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, my name is Mihai Kereji, and I've been working on uh, orchestrating innovation ecosystems report for OECD OPSI and for the LIA project that we're involved in. And I am here to share a few quick uh, key findings from this uh, upcoming report. Uh, I'm not sure if, yes, we are seeing the, the slide right now. So some of the key findings that um, have come up as a result of doing an extensive literature review and from uh, interviews with uh, practitioners from uh, several development uh, and innovation agencies from across Europe have been that ecosystems are complex systems at their core. They are interactions between heterogeneous actors and that gives them emergent behavior that cannot be observed by looking at uh, individual actors' behaviors, their responses are non-linear and unpredictable, and their resilience comes as a consequence of the diversity of the actors and the interactions that uh, happen between these actors and the flows of information and resources that uh, happen as part of this. Losing sight of what makes up an ecosystem and how it behaves can bias orchestrators to set outcomes in terms of innovation metrics or economic growth when the most important train of thought, uh, the most important idea should be to go towards uh, outcomes based on how ecosystems function and uh, achieving a, the right balance between value extraction, value creation, and between the shared purpose that we, uh, uh, everyone seems to agree that is the most important uh, part. 
following a train of thought that uh, you can share, uh, you can put set an outcome in terms of economic growth or uh, pure innovation metrics can lead down to uh, from orchestrating to ordering or focusing on attracting the wrong types of inputs or too much of uh, a certain type of input without balancing the ecosystem. Some most of successful ecosystem initiatives focus on balancing the flows of information, uh, aligning their incentives uh, towards the shared purpose and encouraging autopoiesis or self-regeneration, which relies on an adequate underground, which means uh, having creative forces in the area of the ecosystem and an open middle ground, which uh, gets those creative forces uh, together with the, in, with the institutions, uh, the regime, as it were, universities, companies, uh, the current uh, actors that determine the overall, the overall share of the social technical regime in which we are embedded. And another uh, conclusion, which probably does uh, is already very well known is that context is everything and different interventions are required for ecosystems at different stages of the life cycle, um, which um, comes as a conclusion that you need different inputs and different types of actions. Uh, but more details will come when the report is published. Thank you for your attention. I will hand over back to Jack. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mihai. And uh, yes, that gives a brilliant taste of the kind of conclusions that we're coming to already. Um, and, uh, you know, based on, on some of those, I think it would be great to, um, to now hand over to our speakers. Um, and I've asked them each to prepare a short presentation in response to a broad question, um, which is what skills and approaches can help to balance the diverse interests of these stakeholders that are important to innovation ecosystems? and lead to greater cooperation in the service of a shared goal. And can I ask you first, Nama, and then we will move on to Carrie, and then finally, Char Charlie. Of course, uh, my pleasure. Um, yes, um, I, I was thinking about uh, what kind of answer to give to this question, and it's quite uh, difficult actually, but um, I will try my best. So. Um, we are, uh, we at the Investment and Development Agency of Latvia, we are, uh, I would say, we're not at the very beginning of um, uh, engaging uh, stakeholders and building these ecosystems, but we're definitely not uh, professionals in doing that. So we're still learning from our own mistakes and uh, and also from the mistakes of others, uh, which is far more convenient, right? Um, but uh, obviously, we already have some uh, some conclusions or insights on uh, what we saw that, what, what were the most important things uh, so far. And I would say uh, that it all sort of boils down to like four different uh, well, uh, approaches uh, or skills uh, that really need to be considered and, um, uh, and, and taken into account. So I think uh, the first one, and it might really sound very cliche, but uh, I think it's the enthusiasm of the people who are uh, actually building the ecosystems. Um, and here in this case, for example, I mean my colleagues, my team, um, because without them, without their enthusiasm and their willingness to really uh, try out this approach in general, it would be fairly impossible because um, what we see, what we have seen is um, a somewhat a pessimistic uh, uh, response from from the industry because uh, the companies they don't have much spare time uh, they want to focus on their projects and then we come and we say so we are going to have these ecosystems and you know please join us we will have great results um, and of course they're skeptical at the beginning and and and, and it, that's fair enough um, so uh, it really boils down that to uh, the team that's managing this to have this eco uh, this enthusiasm uh, to address the ecosystem and and uh, and and have us uh, uh, remember the goal why we're here. Um, and of course, uh, also, uh, it's the ability of the team that manages this. And actually, when we when we try to develop the framework on how to how to build the and orchestrate the ecosystems, it's the uh, ability to emphasize the practical aspects and um, identify very realistic gains uh, for uh, for those who are involved, for all the stakeholders, uh, because sometimes uh, uh, we, we, we talk with them and we use these abstract concepts, what well, those might seem as abstract concepts to them, but uh, what they really want is a different kind of um, uh, practical aspects of how we are going to do this, why are we going to, uh, why are we doing this, and so on and so forth. 
And that, of course, again, leads to uh, the ability or it's influenced by the ability to design and explain things in a simple way. And but I think uh, finally, the, the, one of the most important aspects uh, is um, the uh, the ability to set joint uh, joint uh, um, uh, KPIs for uh, for all the stakeholders involved, uh, and and show a clear indication of uh, well, basically two things. So one 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 side is the individual gains for the stakeholders because they also want to know why they are in 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 on this, and then of course also the gains. Um, uh, that the community that they as a group uh, can uh, can achieve, and it's about showing that together they can achieve more uh, than individually. Um, and I think in in, in this, um, what is quite critical is to really assess the maturity levels of the, the stakeholders, so that uh, because they are uh, they are they are sort of uh, aiming for different things. Uh, companies in their life cycles they aim for different things. So obviously it doesn't it's it's counterproductive to uh, put together somebody who is really just trying to make you know the ends meet uh, and and actually I don't know bring some food <laughs> later on uh, home uh, and those who are already have plenty of money and they really have some time to play around with different concepts and think about this so so this is really cr crucial to to have the ability to analyze that to assess that and then uh, coordinate then and and define these KPIs that each of these different groups uh, can actually achieve together yeah so that that's from my side thank you Thank you very much, Lama. It's really interesting to hear about that necessary kind of focus on the partners and really understanding their needs and priorities uh, in order to engage them. Um, Carrie, would you be able to offer your reflections now? Thank you, Jack. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak here uh, from Citrus. We have, uh, we don't talk so much about ecosystems because they are maybe a little bit too abstract for many our kind of collaborators. And uh, in that sense, we are more like uh, focusing on, on kind of bringing different stakeholders together in a very more specific uh, topics itself. And uh, the lessons that we have learned is that you have to have a very good understanding of the groundwork and preconditions of the situation in your local respective region, etc., with your stakeholders. And of course, the, the ability to, to bring uh, the, the key decision makers together and, and shakers and movers who can actually build the, the kind of agenda forward. And it usually helps if you have a very good uh, situational picture of not only your kind of uh, focus area, but the, the overall conditions in the country or in the international field. Already in the in the poll, it was mentioned about the vision and uh, shared vision. I think that that is very crucial to to have for sure. But also to have like more concrete goals, like uh, was mentioned uh, earlier, to to have a KPIs. But uh, one of the things that I'd like to really focus here is also the kind of uh, execution part where you actually have to have also capabilities to inspire wider networks because you can only do so much in your own respective network but if you want to have the bigger impact in the society uh, you have to have a bigger outreach and then you have to have a quite good uh, capabilities of, of communicating widely and of course evaluation and, and revision are a very important part as, as well but that's some of the learnings from our side. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. That was uh, very useful to kind of think about, to reflect on the fact that ecosystems are sometimes too abstract to draw people together as an idea. Um, Charlie, can I hand over to you now? Jack, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the Rockwell Foundation's uh, systems innovation initiative we're interested in how you innovate systems not just products and services because we think it's systems that really change the world and they're very powerful and we're very interested in practical deliberate knowledge to create systems not just theoretical knowledge so we're interested in new systems particularly at Rockwell for care for health social systems for care for work for health education, but you could also apply many of these lessons to our need to create new energy systems, new mobility systems, new housing systems. And if I could just share my screen, I will uh, show you a picture 
of this is our very sophisticated model of systems change called the washing machine. Um, and in a way, the question that we have would be, well, what kind of ecosystems do you need for systems innovation? Um, if your goal is to develop entirely new systems, what kind of different ecosystems does that require? And this model basically is very crude, but basically says there are often new entrepreneurial forces, uh, potentially disruptive, but offering new ideas coming up. There are often insiders who are incumbents who are trying to renew themselves or trying to defend themselves. And there is competition between those, but there's often also quite a lot of complementarity. And quite a lot of the innovation takes place in what we call the washing machine in the middle there. And that washing machine needs to be created, convened, commissioned, funded, orchestrated. And it's out of the relationships that get formed out of that vortex in the middle that we think then new ideas and new systems emerge. And that takes then the role of investors, then, might be a role for exiters who are exiting old activities. There might be a role for consumer innovators. There might be a role for social activists in this process. There's definitely a role for evaluators who are creating new metrics of success. There'll be a role for policymakers. So we think that there are a whole set of roles that need to be um, brought together in order to enable systems change. Um, so that immediately then raises a really big question which both Lama and Carrie have raised, which is if you follow the history of systems change, of case studies, what you see is that it is, as, as we heard at the beginning, it's an emergent process of many different players. And the trouble with that is that it tends to take quite a long time. So it could be described even as a rather meandering process of firstly, you get some technology, then you try out what it's for, then you develop some new systems, and then you tr try out some new purposes. And there's a sort of constant going backward and forward between means and ends and how and why and so on and so forth. So if you read Frank Niels's brilliant case studies of systems transitions, they often take 30 or 40 years. So what if we don't have that long? What if actually we need to create new systems in 10 or 15 years? How would you accelerate that process? So it's into that question then that Mariana Matsukatu steps and offers mission-driven innovation as a way to say, well, if you can set a mission, you can create a framework for all this collaboration and you can drive to change. And it's a very compelling, inspirational vision. I think there's one really big drawback, which is we knew where the moon was. What, what happens if in innovation you don't know where the moon is actually you've got to find it discover it and it's a much more exploratory emergent kind of process and many of our biggest social challenges to do with aging care education work um, we don't quite know where the destination is you've got to try and find it out so we think that in that setting rather than adopting what most innovation programs have which is a kind of funnel going down, you need to adopt something much more like this, which is a kind of amplifier going out. And what you're trying to do is to try and orchestrate a much more intentional process of emergence. So we call it intentional emergence, where you're deliberately trying to synchronize and um, complement and coordinate to some extent, multiple commitments from policymakers, investors, existing companies, new companies, consumers, and you're trying to sort of create a dynamic of that. So that I think is where we think the really interesting questions are. Um, can you accelerate intentional emergence between, if you like, purely emergent models, which leave a lot to chance, and mission-driven models, which are very directed? And we're very interested in what the, what the frameworks and vehicles are for that kind of innovation. Thank you, Charlie. Um, and those, the, some of those earlier points that you mentioned about uh, kind of the roles um, and potential roles for exiters, people exiting the ecosystem is something we'll touch on in a moment. Um, but before we do, I just want to share the results uh, of the um, poll. Can you all see that? Fantastic. So uh, I'm now going to call on um, kind of each of you, whichever one wants to say, have some has something to say first about the responses to the to this poll. Um, 
who would like to go first? I can I can jump in if you want, Jack. Great. Um, in our work, we we talk about these four keys that we work with in systems innovation, um, and those those keys are purpose, power, relationships, and resources. And if you read the literature on systems change, a lot of it says you start with purpose. But actually what we found is you've got to start with relationships because unless you create new relationships, which are probably more equal, so you also shift power, you can't get to new purposes. If you try and develop a new purpose, but you don't open up relationships and power, you'll just get a restatement of existing purposes which reflect existing power relationships. So this dynamic between relationships, power and purpose is uh, we think really, really critical. And ecosystems that really try and develop new kinds of systems would have to play with that sort of relationship. Thank you, that's fascinating because so often we hear, you know, start with why, start with defining the purpose, but um, you know, in these multi-stakeholder partnerships, that's, as you acknowledge, that's often so difficult to get to. Um, Carrie, you've got your hand up. Yeah, sure. So, so very interesting results and uh, reflect also how we see situation from our own perspective. Citra is a neutral player in the Finnish society under the parliament and uh, in the circular economy, particularly uh, we be kind of, uh, there's positive remarks that as we have been forming the agenda, so-called ecosystem here in the circular economy space, it's really about the trust as, as well and uh, that it's it's neutral. So, so there's not like uh, somebody who has a very different agenda setting to others, but it's more like uh, combining the different views is, is important. So, so I understand well what Charles just uh, mentioned. One thing that I see a bit interesting is that uh, a dedicated ecosystem orchestrator didn't get that much votes here because uh, that, that's uh, something that I've been thinking a lot uh, that uh, usually you need to have somebody or uh, let's say multiple organizations that actually drive the process forward. If it's like uh, totally left like uh, floating and uh, there's not leadership uh, in it, it is harder in my opinion. Thank you, that, that surprised me too, but I think because we only forced people to choose one, perhaps that was the second most important thing in lots of people's minds. Um, at least I would imagine it was. Um, Lama, do you have anything to add? Oh yes, uh, I, I would say I'm, I'm not surprised about the result of the poll uh, because uh, this is this is what we really also see from from our experience. And uh, I just wanted to I absolutely I can't uh, add anything else to what Charlie and Kari said because I absolutely agree. And we we also saw that from um, um, uh, our experience. But um, one aspect that I think uh, was not mentioned, but uh, what we also see every day is that um, the the trust. Uh, it can be uh, not only between the uh, the stakeholders that we bring together, but it really, it really is. A, there's a fine line between losing the trust and gaining the trust on the behalf of the coordinators. So we, as coordinators, we are very uh, responsive. We have to understand that uh, for the stakeholders that we bring together, if they don't trust that we can do deliver uh, what we promise, that uh, you know we will help you define the KPIs, we will try to find the shared purpose. And I mean, building this trust is really important as well, because uh, of course, it's very important that uh, that uh, other stakeholders have trust between themselves so that they are at least willing to, uh, to join the table and, and join the talks. But it's really a huge responsibility on the behalf of the, those building and coordinating because they really have to be able to deliver that because it only takes so much for, uh, for companies and other stakeholders, research organizations, to lose this trust and see that, you know, this is going nowhere. We have spent time talking about this, but there are no results. Thank you, Lama. Um, yes, that's fascinating to think, well, I guess it's so vital that you start to deliver some sort of results early on uh, and that these things are not just seen as a talking shop. Um, 